Thank you very much. Um, well, I have the easy task of just making comments uh, based on the presentations, and I must congratulate uh, both Kun Hien and Tong Yen for uh, two very brilliant presentations. So much content compressed in so little time, and, and uh, Kun Hien's particularly actually uh, compresses all the good work that was done by HDB over the last 50 years, so that's half a century of uh, excellent work culminating in uh, the new age type of um, uh, towns that HDB now produces, and Pongol is one of them. Um, the pattern, actually, of uh, how the speakers have presented first and me as the panelists uh, following them is very much the pattern of how the private sector developers uh, work in Singapore. It's very reflective because the government does all the hard work, the private sector comes in after that when all the very difficult stuff is done. Uh, and I, I'm not saying it uh, tongue in cheek, I really mean it because um, good governance is something that we cannot just take for granted. And Singapore has had this uh, amazing governance framework. And of course, that uh, uh, came with the prerequisite uh, of political stability. And that's allowed the government to do a lot of the things. It's been able to put in place very robust master plans. That helps the private sector. So actually, my comments are really coming from the perspective of a private sector developer that we have benefited because uh, plans were very clear and we knew what the thrust of national development uh, really is. And so we benefited by being able to participate. But the government has to do all that hard work. Um, so if we extract, if we are able to extract some learning points from the presentations, I would say that first of all, private sector developers would want to go to a place to participate in the development of urban centres and uh, also being able to create uh, quality urban living if first of all there's a good governance framework, there's good clear master planning and followed by good maintenance and security. Singapore would not be what it is today if we did not have high standards of maintenance and very, very good security, because that's what buyers want. The middle classes, when we talk about the ascent of the middle classes, which is gonna drive demand and uh, uh, start the, the flow of uh, products and services, the middle classes want a good, safe living environment. They want security for themselves and for their family. And at the heart of this as well, um, in Singapore, and therefore we've been able to replicate something like this in China, um, the eco-city, is innovation. Constant innovation, learning and relearning. Because innovation, and, and that has been proven in corporations, there are studies that show that there's a very high correlation between innovation and growth. Maybe studies have not uh, proven that in communities and societies, but all of us in this room intuitively know that if there's no innovation, there's not going to be sustainable growth. But in corporations, it's, it's uh, clearly done. Uh, there have been very good studies sh showing that innovation actually uh, gives the foundation for growth and change, which cities must have and urban areas must have this uh, ability to grow and change. And sustainability, I must add, as a developer, is not just about green sustainability, but sustainability in every sense of the word, that there is value created, and that, of course, uh, developers can make profit, and uh, therefore plow the profit into new investments. The city itself must be able to, uh, uh, well, first of all, values created, but the city itself and the municipal authorities must be able to uh, realize that value through perhaps land sales or sales of uh, land to developers, uh, thereby putting in place a, uh, uh, a mechanism that allows that value to be uh, clawed by the, the municipal government to be plowed in to uh, reinvestment. So in Singapore, this model exists. There is no bottomless pit, there is no subsidies, 
that uh, just you know are uh, washed down into the drain. But whatever is um, invested in the community and in the country is in a way uh, clawed back uh, via the government's tax collection or via the uh, land sales and so on. So this is quite important because if you don't have a sustainable model, then your idea of a uh, good urban living centre is something that is going to be ephemeral. It's not going to last forever. So we've had the benefit of this. Uh, last comment that I have is that the HDB itself has been a very important agent of change and of planning and execution. Um, Kun Hien tried to give us a flavour of all the, the uh, intense work and I would say in fact it's very ideas and management intensive but because you know uh, given the pressures of time she couldn't actually uh, do that uh, you know fully but for those of us that operate in this context we know how much ideas and management there goes into it. So this must also be present that the agencies involved in creating urban centres, and we talk about the quality of urban uh, uh, living in new centres and the future of it, there has to be a very strong agency that is vested with this task and able to learn and relearn, which the HDP has been able to do. Because the more they do, and in fact, uh, Kun Hien is the CEO of the largest housing developer in the world. <laughs> I don't think anybody on the, yeah, not not in China yet because the China is quite still quite fragmented. Uh, no, no housing agency has done more than one million units anywhere in, in the world. So HDB has done that. So I think that the learning and the relearning that's offered by this is very very important because if you don't learn from successes as well as mistakes, then you can't replicate something like an eco Tianjin city. So thank you very much. I, I think these are my comments. Thank you, Philip. Philip has uh, made some very uh, profound statements concerning the, uh, the role of the uh, private sector. Of course, I think he, he uh, would say that uh, it is important to have good governance. I think this is a must. This is the necessary condition. But what's more important is the ability for the private sector to work together with the public sector. So this partnership, this co-creation approach, I think will be able to uh, result in uh, very positive outcomes. So for the next five minutes, I think probably we can have some sort of a small discussion among the panelists. Now on this note of partnership between the public and private sector, I know as uh, the number one uh, uh, developer in the world, uh, Gudhien, you have uh, been responsible for the uh, development of and also management of one million uh, units. And of course, the uh, management issue is a, a challenge. Making residents happy is a challenge. But I think in recent years, we are seeing quite a lot of uh, private developments inside HDB estates. So how would you, as well as Philip, uh, describe the uh, interplay between the uh, HDB and the uh, private uh, developers? How do we have uh, both peace to coexist in harmony. Okay. Um, actually, I wanted to answer a question in a very different way and nothing to do with HDB, but I'll answer the question first and if I may, just make a couple of comments. Uh, I think when HDB does the planning of the town, it's very comprehensive and exactly like what Philip said. You actually put in all the guts you know, needed for uh, uh, the town to function, whether it's roads, infrastructure, and you have thought through really from a planning and urban design point of view how you are going to develop a public sector uh, uh, facility and housing, especially and also incorporating uh, the private sector. So some of the pieces of land are actually left to the private sector. And I'll just share with you what exactly happened yesterday at a meeting. One of the parcels of land is along the Pongo Waterway. Now, in, in uh, HDB, uh, the projects are ungated. That means people can walk through, there's no fencing. But the private sector is gated. So we had this project next to HDB, and uh, 
when we sold the land, I made sure that some of the conditions was that the private developer had to think through how to integrate very well with the uh, public spaces, including the Pongo Waterway. And we asked them to be innovative in doing a design that allows this to happen. So I think the uh, developers responded very well with highly innovative design ideas using landscape in order to maintain privacy, but seamlessly uh, integrate with public space. So I think that is uh, one uh, real example. But actually the public-private sector partnership is really in Singapore, if I go beyond HDB, Singapore is very good at doing uh, where government is slightly socialistic and always taking care of the public interest, but it's very good at working with the private sector and tapping on the private sector resource, energy, and creativity to deliver social objectives. That itself is a whole topic of its own, but I think there's a happy public-private partnership. Can I, yeah. can I say, uh, yes, please, please go ahead. Can I just say something about this private part, uh, public partnership in the context of Tianjin Eco City? I think we see in many different parts of China this phenomenon of empty cities, where cities are built without any residents, without much amenities, and so on. I think this example of different stakeholders, sometimes the local government, building ahead of what the market uh, demands. And I think the role of the uh, of the private sector in the Tianjin Eco City is, in some ways, to always have this check and balance role. In some ways, we are very much focused on what the market can support. The government may have a certain pace in mind. We will build according to demand. The government may want to push the limits of green standards. At the same time, we have to bear in mind what do residents want, what, does, what do commercial operators, factory owners want to see. And I think that is the balancing role that we play. Yeah. Well, Singapore has a very unique uh, formula and structure and, and the public housing uh, owners, uh, the people that buy pub uh, public housing from the government at subsidized prices are able after five years to sell it. So in effect, uh, the public uh, dwelling units become in a way transactable on the market. That creates uh, wealth for them. So this is quite unique in uh, Singapore that there's uh, wealth creation for the people via the public uh, housing program. And that creates demand for us private sector developers. So we're really at the next uh, part of the value chain. And we would not be able to have as much demand as there is in Singapore today, if not for the fact that the first home of most Singaporeans invariably is that public housing unit, where about 80 to 83 percent of Singaporeans uh, live in public housing. So that's quite unique. And I think uh, going back to something like Eco uh, City in Tianjin, which has drawn a lot of international developer, developers to want to participate, it goes back to what I've said again, that first of all, developers must be sure, number one, there's demand. Number two, that there's good governance, that what is uh, promised is going to be executable and executed. So there must be a good master plan, good communications, uh, and that's what's necessary. Thank you. I think this is the signal that I, I must now open the, uh, uh, the floor uh, for discussion. Any uh, comments? Anybody? Yes. Hello. Um, I'm Cheong Suk Wai from The Straits Times. This question is for Mr. Ho Tong Yen. Um, Tongyen, you mentioned that um, about a year ago, there were only, or maybe uh, slightly before that, um, there were about a thousand uh, residents in your eco city, but now that figure has jumped to six thousand. Um, I'd like to know what changed to encourage that. Thanks very much. I think in some ways, you know, it's not different from why you or I would choose to move somewhere, right? Because the place is growing. We now have schools. Um, a neighborhood center market will be open soon. 
Um, there is uh, going to be a hospital coming up in 2015 and so on. So the whole quality of life proposition is improving as the city develops. But I also have to say that you know, development of a city takes time. It's not the same as not just putting a few building blocks together. You actually need, to, people will look uh, at the development, they look at various considerations and then slowly decide to move in. It's a very chicken and egg issue. Do you have more shops and jobs first or do you have residents and a workforce first? And I think the two have to take, uh, take place and um, grow incrementally. So I'd say 6,000 is a reasonable uh, population uh, given the macro environment as well as some of the policies in place in China. Um, they have been putting in place policies to cool the property market. But I'm very confident that you know, as we go uh, further down the road, the eco city will hit uh, a critical tipping point and then the population growth will, will grow up very rapidly after that. We have another question from the floor. Hello, uh, they're both very inspiring presentations. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question for either Kun Hen or Tong Yen um, in relation to community involvement in the master planning process and the extent to which it's important to you when you're thinking about the community, uh, about this, this new city, to get input from uh, the broader population, how that happens and any challenges you see around those issues. Okay, well, cities are really, or towns, are actually built for people. So in, in Singapore, I mean, as a whole, there is a lot of public consultation, uh, especially in the last maybe 15 years, this has really taken off, and more and more people want to have a say. Uh, so the process, of course, it's efficient to do it top down, but I don't think that is what it's about. You really need to also know from bottom up. So the process is actually in peril, both top down and bottom up. And so all, almost all major plans, uh, there is public consultation, and the consultation takes many forms. There is mass consultation, but mass consultation sometimes is not uh, necessarily effective. Huh? But there is also in parallel smaller groups of people that you might meet up with. They are interest groups or they are experts. So all this is put together, the, the comments, before plans are really finalized. And in recent years, there are also uh, basically just ground-up initiatives. For example, the URA uh, uh, tap on a lot of ideas for, uh, we had an old rail corridor that was uh, returned to Singapore from Malaysia, and, and people were very excited about it. But what, what, what ideas, you know, what, what do you want to put on this rail corridor? So there were many, many ideas from the public. So I think these are all really very positive. The thing to learn is about co-creating. How do you co-create? And it is a difficult process because we're often in a hurry, but co-creation takes time. So I think we have to learn, I speak more from the public sector point of view, we need to really slow things down sometimes and talk before you do. And in Singapore, that's quite difficult. <laughs> we have to learn to hold back a little bit, wait, and sometimes time is a very good uh, uh, balancing for uh, many different views. So I think we have to take time to listen and to work with people. I can respond very quickly because um, at the start of the project, we started building a city from wasteland. So there was no meaningful population to consult at that point. But certainly as we progress, we try to take on board the views of uh, people. For example, recently there was a design competition for the uh, city center and we got members of the public to vote on the urban design that they preferred. And that played a role in the government's eventual decision. Can I just add uh, to what Tongyan said, you do Tomai Tongyan. I was involved in the master plan for the Tianjin Eco City at the very initial stages. I was out there when it was all salt farms, you know, in the middle of winter. And uh, one of the things uh, that China now has is a good process. They have actually have, they do have a process of public consultation which is uh, legislated. So when they actually did the plan, they had it online and there was consultation. But I'm not sure if there was a lot of feedback because it was so new. Nobody knew where is this place, you see. But I just want to say that they do have a, 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 a process of consultation. Maybe, uh, okay, last two questions. <laughs> uh, 
thank you for a great presentation. Uh, I want to ask you about the uh, sustainability in the digital space. So we have learned a lot about the sustainability in the eco city, but the, um, as you mentioned, uh, in the smart city and also digitalized city, I think. It is also important to address the sustainability in the digital space. So currently, um, there are a lot of cyber issues related to the, especially with the children, the cyberbullying, game addictions, and free access to porns, and a lot of dangers in that pre uh, inappropriate inappropriate materials. And the cybersecurity is uh, one of the key concerns in the modern society. Uh, can you please enlighten us with your insights on this? Well, I think this is a very uh, big topic. I'm not too sure whether the uh, subsequent uh, panel will be uh, addressing it. And uh, I do know that uh, in the audience, we have got uh, Mr. Peter Ho, who is uh, quite an expert in this particular space. But maybe, <laughs> would you like to make a comment now, or would you want to uh, wait for your later session? Maybe it's better to wait for the later session. Eh? It's a very big, big topic. Two more. Uh, Questions? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mike, please. <coughs> question, uh, yeah, no, the mic's here. Thank you. Uh, my question is also on planning. The HDB uh, strength seems to be in long-term planning and comprehensive planning, bringing all the elements together, as you said. Uh, the question I have is, how do you get construction, environment, transport, waterways, all of this to combine in actually in the planning stage. How do you get the bureaucracy to work together? That's a very big question. <laughs> yeah, we need another panel. <laughs> yeah. But OK, in a nutshell, I, I just want to speak of the experience of Singapore. And then I do understand where your question is coming from. In Singapore, fortunately, because we're a city state and a single tier government, uh, very often, we work very closely with all agencies. So I give an example. When I do a plan, I actually have many agencies sitting with me, and we go through the plan and we iron out all the problems because there's always conflict between roads and uh, land use and uh, rail, you know, and uh, also getting in uh, uh, water agencies to agree to do some things because I want to use the water for recreation but they may have a different objective, although now I must say the objectives are very well aligned, so we're very fortunate. So the whole of government approach is quite necessary, and you do have to put in place an administrative process, because the experience in most cities is that the agencies don't talk and they fight amongst each other. So it is a big problem, I recognize that. So it's about putting in place administrative structures where you put in the right people who are able to make those decisions to sit together and make sure the plan is uh, done together and can be implemented and, redu and reducing as many conflicts and obstacles as possible. That's, that's just a general answer. So for example, in the URA's concept plan process where they look at plans 30, 40 years ahead of time, it is really a national planning exercise. You have many committees and many, many agencies sitting together and ultimately you will have conflicts and somebody has to decide where's the trade-off. And uh, fortunately for us, we have uh, quite a good uh, uh, cabinet uh, which actually discusses this on a national level and sometimes the very difficult decisions, they have to take a decision and that's the direction we all take. So that's in a really nutshell, yeah? Uh, last question, very briefly, please. Uh, Mike, please. No, that would be the last question. In order to... Uh, over there, the lady. Thank you very much. Uh, Vivian from Philanthropy Works. Um, sustainability is, of course, a key part of, um, you know, urban cities going forward, and that was uh, also a major prong of your very excellent speeches earlier. And Kun Yen, I've heard of how your staff actually want to follow you as you move from agency to agency. So it's a pleasure to see you in action today. Um, so my question relates to KPIs and how we assess how we do um, on key measures like sustainability. 
Um, and in one of the slides uh, that I believe Tong Yin flashed for a few seconds, uh, there were a few indicators that stood out. Um, the, on carbon emission, I believe the threshold you used was uh, 150, and it was VS uh, GDP growth, I believe, or GNP growth, GDP probably. Um, isn't there a natural um, you know, economy of scale as you move up that curve anyway? So you would expect um, you know, carbon emissions to be lowered. So is that sustainability measure um, one that brings us in the right direction? Uh, there was another measure that spoke of, I'm not sure whether it was 212 um, square meters of you know, public green space per person. So what does that measure look like uh, for Singapore? Okay, I think maybe we should uh, take a pause and we can conclude the session after Dong Yin's uh, comments. Yeah. I, there was another slide that I flashed for a few seconds, and it was this balance between different goals of different stakeholders. I think the types of questions you face are precisely those we have to deal with. Yes, that may not be the higher standard that one came in for, but I think that's practical. That's what we are going for. So 12 square meters of green space is more than what a typical Chinese city in North China has. So that's what we're aiming for. Something better, significantly better than business as usual. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we had wonderful presentations, very good uh, comments. Now I'd like to ask the uh, speakers to summarize in less than one minute, what would be your parting shot as regard how to create a good quality of life for our future urban uh, living? Starting from uh, Kun Hien. Okay, one minute. I, I think it's a great challenge, but I also think it's a great opportunity. To create a much better future, we all need to work together. I think we need creativity and innovation, but we also need a lot of perseverance and determination to make it happen. And it really is a partnership between the government and the private sector. I say I've been living in Tianjin for three years now and really building the eco-city. I think it's a bold experiment by the two governments. But I think what we've shown really is that the eco-city is no longer just some tree huggers dream. They are for real. Uh, they are viable, they are, they are attractive propositions. And I believe in time to come, we'll see that elements of what we're doing in Tianjin, these eco city concepts, will be in every new city that will be developed in China and elsewhere. Okay, I um, would like to re emphasize that um, we do need to have good, robust structures, the governance structure, the planning and execution. But besides that, I think the middle classes want distinctiveness and identity in urban living spaces. And that is something that we must have and not uh, homogenize the uh, urban uh, centers as may happen in China. So distinctiveness will come from looking at the components of live, work, play. I think there should, there's room for worship because if you see in Europe and many uh, countries, the uh, places of worship actually occupy a very big space. I know in HDB plans they do have that, but the land area may not be sufficient enough for this identity to come. So I think the, the worship component is also there, and it's also the aspirations of uh, the middle classes too. Thank you very much.